All right, let's say our blessing for learning. Praise to you, Lord of God, rule the universe, who's made us holy with your commandments and command us to the Asuk, busy yourself with the words of Torah. So with that, we're going to jump into uh, um, learning about Hanukkah customs. Um, tonight, I'll do the talking. Um, if, hopefully you'll forgive me. Uh, um, so we have nine different customs to learn about tonight. And our zero with one representing the Shamas or Shamash is the spelling of the holiday. So there are at least eight different ways of spelling the holiday, um, all depending on what you double or leave out. Um, the ninth one would be with a J at the beginning, because in Ladino, which is Judeo-Spanish, um, the J makes the Ch sound. And there's also Hanukkah in Yiddish spelled in English letters, and that looks completely, that looks different from other spellings of the word in English. Um, there are all these different spellings because it's all spelling a Hebrew word in English letters, and there are different ideas about how to go about doing that. There are only two ways to spell the holiday in Hebrew, um, and the only difference between them is how you do the U, whether you do it with a shiruk and put a vav in there, or you do it with the kibbutz and don't have a vav. Um, however you spell it, the name means rededication since the temp second temple was rededicated after the Syrian Greeks trashed it and put it in a statue of Zeus. All right, on to dreidels. Um, and recognizing that people learn in different ways, um, I will be reading much of what is on the screen and then you can look over it again later. So dreidels, for those um, not familiar since I don't want to make assumptions, are a four-sided top. Um, they have the Hebrew letters Nun, Gimel, He, and Shin on them, unless you're in Israel, in which case, um, thank you, Abba. Then you have a dreidel that has a Pe on it instead of a Shin. Hold it over here by my camera, um, because, well, we'll talk about why in a minute. Uh, um, so the dreidel is used to play a gambling game, among other things that you can do with the dreidel. I've also used the dreidel to settle disputes amongst children, sort of like flipping a coin, except people choose letters on the dreidel and whatever it lands on, that's what you get. Um, this is why I carry a dreidel with me year round. Um, the letters on a dreidel, oh, and that's because you never know when you'll need a dreidel. Also good for amusing small children in airports um, and for a fidget toy. So the letters on a dreidel stand for Neskadol Hayasham, if you're not in Israel, or Neskadol Hayapo, if you are in Israel, a great miracle happened there, or a great miracle happened here. The story, which is often told about why we have the dreidel, and what I thought was the answer until about a week ago, is that because the Syrian Greeks said that um, it was illegal to learn Torah, the Jews would go out into the woods and learn Torah in secret, and if soldiers came by, they'd quickly sit on their books and pull out a dreidel and just pretend to be gambling. Mm -hmm. um, as we'll see, there's more to this story than just that. Before we get to that, the song, I Have a Little Dreidel, was written in 1927 by Samuel Goldfarb, who is a Tin Pan Alley composer. Um, he is the younger brother of Israel Goldfarb, who composed the um, primary tune for Shomo Efem um, and an the older tune for Vashamru, um, among other two things. Um, well, I Have a dreidel, Little Dreidel was written in the 20s. It didn't really take off until the 1950s. And we'll see these decades come back again later in the story of Hanukkah. Now, there are lots of explanations why we use a dreidel in Hanukkah. One of them is because of gematria. Gematria is an alphanumeric code. Um, so Aleph is one, Bet is two, Gimel is three. So the four letters, nun, gimel, he, shin, if you add them together, you get 358. 358 also happens to be equal to the letters in the word Mashiach, which means Messiah. 
And so the idea is that, you, is that uh, spinning a dreidel is an act of messianic hope. Alternatively, 358 also equals the letters of Nachash, which means serpent, the serpent being the one that um, tempted Eve in the Garden of Eden, um, and so represents evil and temptation. And so by spinning the dreidel and having it topple over, we are toppling evil and temptation. That is another interpretation of this. Additionally, with the toppling, we have this small army toppling the less strong army. Um, the letters um, are said to, that the nun is equal to Nebuchadnezzar, which represents Babylonia. The hey equals Haman, which represents Persia. The gimel equals Gog, which represents Greece. And the sin or shin represents Seir, which equals Adom, which equals Esau, which equals Rome. Um, and all of these fell over. All of these eventually fell. That is uh, the interpretation of Rabbi Tzvi Elimel Shapiro of Dinov in his text, B'nai Yisachar. Additionally, we have the nun equaling to nefesh, which is soul. The gimel equals the goof, which is the body. The sin or shin equals seichel, which is the mind. And he equals hakol, everything. And when you spin a dreidel, you blend all these four components into an indistinguishable oneness. So yet another reason why we spin the dreidel. Uh, um, I tend to approach many things in Judaism, Judaism with the perspective that there is the explanation given for it or the level or the meaning derived from it. And then the actual reason why we started doing it in the first place. So historically, the reason why we started doing it has to do with the Irish and their Christmas games. Uh, so there was a um, game called Totem, meaning all, it's a game play with the top. It was a Christmas game played by the Irish and the English. It goes back to about 1500 CE. By 1720, it had become called Teetotem. And the original letters on a Teetotem top are T for totem, which means take all, A for offer, take from the pot, N for nihil, meaning nothing, and D for depone, which means put in the pot. So this may seem familiar for those of you familiar with how you play the game of dreidel today. Um, by 1801, we have new letters representing the English words, T for take all, H for half, P for put down, and N for nothing. When this game went to Germany, it got a new name. It's now called Trundle. And it got new letters because it's German, not English. So we have the G for Gantz, which means all. The H for Hull, but means half. The, nix, the N for Nix, meaning nothing. And the S for Stein, Stel Ein, put in. Stel Ein, put in. Um, and these letters might look familiar if you think about the letters on a dreidel. Then we have the Yiddish equivalent coming from the German. So now it's called a dreidel, which means a little spinning thing. Comes from the German word drehen, meaning spin. So we have the letter G or Gimel for Gantz, H or He for Halb, N or Nun for Nit, Nit meaning not or nothing, and then S or Shin for Stel Arain, Arain of put in. Now the dreidel was known by other things, depending on where you lived in the Yiddish speaking world. Um, one of the options was Goyerol, which means destiny, and Varfel, which is a little throne. Um, these names disappeared after the Holocaust. Dreidel was the most widespread, so it had the best chance of surviving. I happen to think that Varfel is a fantastic name for a dreidel, um, but dreidel is what we have. In Hebrew, it's called a Sivivon, which is a little spinner. And the name Sivivon comes from the son of Eliezer ben Yehuda. Eliezer ben Yehuda was the man in the 1880s who, um, who brought Hebrew back to life as a modern language. Um, Itamar ben Avi was his son and the first native born Hebrew speaker. He was born in 1882. And when he was five, he was given the chance to name the dreidel a Hebrew name. So he called it a Sivivon because it sows, it spins. So what's interesting about the dreidel is that the Syrian Greeks wanted us to take on their culture and lose ours. And the dreidel represents us taking on another culture and making it part of ours. 
which I think is a really interesting takeaway oh. from the aspect of Hanukkah. David? Questions, comments about dreidels? Question. Yeah. Given the history, uh, does this mean that the dreidel was not found in Sephardic or Mizrahi countries? Good question. Um, to my knowledge, the dreidel was not originally in Sephardic or Mizrahi countries. Um, I'm guessing that as those communities um, met Ashkenazi communities in Israel and in the United States, it spread amongst those communities as well. Um, I don't know if it then got taken back to homeland communities, so to speak, um, in Mizrahi countries. Um, but that is a that is a good question. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Worried about uh, the gematria. Yeah. I remember learning when I was younger that the spelling that comes out to 358 could also stand for Hashem Melech, Hashem Yim Moloch, Hashem Yim Loch. Interesting. Uh, when you add it up. I had learned that back in Hebrew college, but and I thought it today. So. <laughs> Thank you. I had not encountered that, but that makes a lot of sense. Is the um, goiro, which you said they're the destiny, is that the same as the word for the casting of lots in, in uh, for on the on the one that go, go raw load that fall on on the um, uh, uh, goat? Yes. That, that would be connected to um, in the story of Yom Kippur, the biblically, um, there would be two lots that were cast to determine which goat would be sacrificed and which goat would be sent off with the community sends the scapegoat. Um, the Hebrew and the Hebrew word for the for the lot was goral, um, and so the Yiddish word goyrol comes from that. Um, and so, because the way that the dreidel falls determines your destiny at that moment in the dreidel game, it got the name destiny as well. Other questions or comments about dreidels? So let me ask if am I misunderstanding that the dreidel didn't exist during uh, in ancient times? Then is this just something that's more recent? You said eighteen hundreds, or am I misunderstanding? You're you're not misunderstanding. Um, the dreidel goes back to the dreidel, and it's in the form that we know it goes back to the fifteen hundreds. There are some scholars that believe that totem came to England via the Crusades or possibly the Romans, which I know is a big difference. Um, but one of those sets of soldiers that also were stationed in the Middle East and they might've picked it up in the Middle East and brought it to, to um, the British Isles. Um, but most scholars, all scholars will agree, or well, most scholars will agree. I'm not going to say all scholars agree on anything. Most scholars will agree that dreidels definitely date back to the 1500s. And a few scholars would say that it goes back to the ancient Middle East. So then we're not quite sure about the story of folks um, having this smoke screen of gambling in case uh, the Syrians came by the... No. Um, all right. Okay. And... And actually, to Alan's original question, what you're asking now, Charles, makes me think uh, or reminds me that I did see somewhere in my preparations for this class that when dreidels reached country, reached Sephardic countries, they didn't have the cultural background that the Ashkenazi Jews had. And so they came up with some other explanations that we saw about this. Ah. Um, so I guess I, I take back what I said earlier, um, Alan. Okay. Now, thank you for the clarification. I'm... Yeah, it's it's good. While we're knocking down the <laughs> um, origin stories, uh, I, I get 
I don't know what was happening in the 16th century and 1500s that was so creative, but I think that's the earliest reference to the cup of Elijah on the, at the Seder too. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Huh. I have no idea, but I wouldn't be surprised. Cool. All right, let's go on. So, gout. What is the story behind gout? So, uh, um, as a reminder, gout are foil covered chocolate coins. They usually come in mesh bags and can be used when playing dreidel or just eat. Uh, um, gout is the other short for money. And originally they were actual money. Um, so, Money was given on Hanukkah, according to the Bells of Rebbe, as a way of just learning the distinguishment between those who needed tzedakah and those who didn't. Um, this was his take on the matter. Um, they were also considered, or giving money was considered a, um, a good thing to do on Hanukkah because it connected to the Hanukkah story um, in the Book of Maccabees, when first Book of Maccabees, um, one sign that the Syrian Greeks had decided that the Judeans could have their independence was they were, uh, was Simon uh, the Hasmonean was given permission by the Seleucids to uh, print money, to coin, um, to do their own coinage. Um, this began in 142 BCE, and those original coins had a menorah on them, the seven branch menorah. Um, so giving gout connected to that part of the story. In recognition of this, um, starting in 1958, Israel made commemorative Hanukkah coins to be used as gout and dreidel games. Uh, the first one had a menorah like the Hasmonean coins, the same menorah. Um, in 1972, they made one with a Russian menorah, uh, making a point about let my people go and the freedoms of Soviet Jewry. In 1976, they made one with a colonial menorah design on it, or Hanukkah design on it. Um, and each year they honor different Jewish community around the world. The giving of coins may also be inspired by the Purim customs of Mishloch Menor and Matinola of your name, where we give gifts to friends and those in need. Now, according to Leo Koenig, uh, um, the Word for Hanukkah and the word for education share the same Hebrew root of Chet Nun Chaf. Um, and so this is why in the 1700s in Europe, children would be given coins to give to their usually unpaid teachers on Hanukkah, similar to tipping the postal carrier on Christmas today. Um, and then later on, children got coins to encourage their studies with the idea being that coins would be set aside to fund their future studies. We know about this in part from the writer Shol Malachim, who has a story that's been published in English called Hanukkah Money, um, where he writes about children going house to house to collect gout, actual coins, in the late 1800s. Also in the 1800s, showing that this was not just a Ashkenazi tradition, uh, poor Sephardic children would go door to door in Hanukkah, <coughs> offering to burn sweet grasses to ward off the evil eye, in exchange for some coins. A yeah. treat. Yes. Now, in the 1920s in America, um, people started giving gout, which could be actually some coins to saving bonds or stock certificates in greeting cards um, to the, as a thing to give between friends. Noticing this, Lofts, which was an American candy company, um, started producing gold covered chocolate coins um, as candy gout. Similar to making candy cigars, they made candy money. Um, and so these caught on. Um, probably the main scholar of on Jews and chocolate, Rabbi Deborah Prinz, um, who wrote the book on the chocolate trail connects these coins to geld, which were chocolate coins given to children in the Netherlands and Belgium for the St. Nicholas holiday in early December. Mm. Um, 
other chocolate creations that were started in the 1920s were chocolate Maccabees and chocolate latkes, but these were not as popular as chocolate gout. Today, most gout, most chocolate gout is produced in Israel by the elite and Carmid companies, <clears throat> and then sold to various companies that package it and sell it in the United States. Um, some cup families today do still give actual money to children, um, but they use it as saying that the children must give the money to a stock designation, some sort of organization of their own choosing. Um, and this process has been reinforced by the organization Fifth Night, which has tried to get everybody to do this on the fifth night of Hanukkah to make it more of an actual thing. One other note about gout is that there is fair trade gout now. So chocolate um, is often produced under oppressive conditions for the workers um, and fair trade gout sources from um, companies that only treat their, their workers in the environment fairly. Um, so you can buy fair trade gout. Um, it's not too late this year, eh, probably, certainly not in future years, and you know, gout is good the rest of the year too, um, so that others don't have to suffer for our enjoyment of freedom. And here's a link that you can access, fairtradejudaica.org. What questions are there about the story of gout? Milk chocolate or dark chocolate? Milk chocolate. The answer to that is both because uh, some of the American producers wrap the dark chocolate in silver and the milk chocolate in gold for whatever reason. When you buy chocolate milk from white toys, that's, you can specify what you want. But it's still in the little net bags. Yep. David, I did like that you quoted Leah Koenig. Thank you. She knows a lot. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's go on to presents. David? Yes. How has how value of chocolate gelt been affected by inflation? <laughs> Depends from year to year. But uh, um, fortunately, everybody has the same gout to work with. All right, the story behind Hanukkah presents. So, as we just saw, originally the only gifts that were given to children were coins. Um, and American Jews just gave gifts to each other in Purim as part of very elaborate Mishloch Manot, where we give um, at least two different types of food to our friends. In the late 1800s, um, for many people in America, Christmas became more of a focus on buying and giving gifts instead of the religious aspects. Um, there was a lot of bemoaning of the commercialization of Christmas um, in the late 1800s. In the 1920s, advertisers such as Colgate noticed that Jews were giving um, gout to each other, to their friends. And so they started advertising in the, in the Yiddish newspapers that, uh, you know, besides giving your friends um, stocks or, or savings bonds, why don't you give them some toothpaste too, or various other things. Uh, um, and so this became the thing to do, Colgate and you know, other brands as well. Um, later on in the 1940s, we start getting Hanukkah specific products like Hanukkah pot holders and Hanukkah greeting cards. Um, and in the late 1940s, we start um, with the first Judaica wholesalers, such as Jacob Rosenthal, who started Right Aid, or not Right Aid, Right Light. Um, and these wholesalers began um, in the wake of the Holocaust as American Jews started to feel that the future of world jewelry was on their shoulders. 
in the 1950s, as we have the baby boom, uh, um, we start getting more gift giving to children um, at, because there was a concern that Jewish children might be sad about not having Christmas and we want them to like Hanukkah and be happy about being Jewish. So we should give them presents. Uh, um, and then in the 1980s, when we have the millennials starting to arrive, um, we start getting child-centered Hanukkah items like Hanukkah stickers and there's really big dreidels that have gelt in them. Um, so that didn't start till the 80s. And then finally in the 1990s, um, Judaica wholesalers got Hanukkah spot on the department store shelves. Um, today, gifts and Hanukkah is still more of an American thing than a thing in other communities, or Jewish communities around the world. Um, and some families try to de-emphasize this or get, give de-emphasize gift receiving by setting aside a night, setting aside a night for volunteering to help others, or saying that one night the money that we would have spent on presents will be given to an organization, and the family can decide on what that organization should be together. All right, questions about the history of giving gifts on Hanukkah. Those children that celebrate Christmas are unhappy they only get gifts one day instead of eight days. Hmm. Yes, fortunately they have uh, Santa Claus all over the place to uh, help them feel like their, uh, their holiday is being seen. Can you scroll that up a little bit so I can see the 50s? Yeah, sorry, the other up, yes. That's when I grew up. Mm. Did you receive Hanukkah gifts as a child? Yes. I don't remember. And Christmas, too. Huh. Dreidels and gilt. Mm. I, don't remember, I don't remember Hanukkah gifts. Uh, uh, I must have gotten, I guess we lit candles. My mother also used to let us get a couple of things on Christmas Eve because of our the neighborhood where we lived. We were the only Jewish family and I did feel left out. So mm. she would she wake up Christmas her, morning. Pardon? From a parent's perspective, I will tell you that, um, sorry for interrupting Carol, that okay. one of the rites of passage for a growing family is when the kids would all agree that they no longer needed a separate gift for each night of Hanukkah, but that having a family gift each night that all three kids could enjoy, or even when they got a little bit older, them giving us parents gifts. Um, Mashiach, so we should be so lucky. Um, but that was the way to trace the growth of many families of us baby boomers as our kids uh, who are all millennials. Many of us are, our kids are millennials uh, as they matured through those, uh, those years of um, growth in the present giving experience. I don't know how many of you may have seen the article in yesterday's New York Times business section about the um, sales of so many companies, uh, retailers that put out sort of rebadged Christmas merchandise. So, you know, you get uh, uh, a stocking with a menorah embroidered on it or things with Santa, but, you know, happy, happy Hanukkah. Um, and of course, there's, you know, uh, uh, happy, happy Yom Kippur and uh, all kinds of stuff like that. So it, it was a, it was an interesting article. And there's also a group on Instagram called Hanukkah Fails, which details all of these misbegotten efforts. Huh. 
many new, new people who had Hanuk Hanukkah bushes in their home. I knew, I knew one family that had this tree, a white tree decorated with blue. And that was supposedly a Hanukkah bush. Used to drive me nuts. Anyway. <laughs> mm. All right, let's go on to the story behind the story. So, our story begins in 332 BCE when Alexander the Great conquered the land of Israel on his way to rowing from Greece to India. He eventually dies, coming back from India, and his empire is divided between his generals. The land of Israel goes to um, Ptolemy, which who was in Egypt, or Ptolemy, I guess. Um, and 198 BCE, the Seleucids, who were in Syria, gained control of the land of Israel. Um, and in order to establish Israel as a buffer zone against Egypt, Antiochus IV sought to culturally tie the Jews into his empire by getting rid of Judaism. The Hasmoneans didn't like this, um, and so they led a revolt starting in 164 BCE, led by Judah Maccabee. Um, as is recorded in the first and second books of Maccabees, the Jews managed to get the Syrian Greeks to, redraw, to withdraw, um, and this gave them a chance to clean up and rededicate the second temple. Um, in the process of sacking the, the temple the first time around, um, Antiochus had uh, taken the original menorah back to Syria, so the Jews made a new menorah, and then they lit it. Now, according to the first book of Maccabees, the dedication ceremony took eight days. And although this is not explicitly stated, it is likely that the reason for this is because the original dedication ceremony for the first temple with King Solomon also took eight days. The, according to the second book of Maccabees, which was also like the first book of Maccabees written shortly after the events. The dedication ceremony took eight days because they missed Sukkot during the fighting and Sukkot took eight days. 600 years later, we got the Pasikta Rabati. Um, and according to this text, when the Jews were cleaning up the temple, they found eight spears stuck in the ground. And so they hauled out the ends and used that as a makeshift menorah because they didn't have the original one. Um, and to be fair, the first book of Maccabees only says the menorah and other vessels were taken away and they made new vessels. It does not explicitly say that they made a new menorah. Now, according to the Babylonian Talmud, also written about 600 years after these events, the Jews only found enough sealed oil to last one day of the menorah, but a miracle occurred and it lasted eight days until more oil could be produced. Now, I'm not going to say that this didn't actually happen. However, I will point out a few things. One, this seems like a big deal and it wasn't written down in either of the Book of Maccabees which were written shortly after the events. And you'd think that if this, like, if that this, something this big would make it into the accounting of the events. Also, it's important to know that the rabbis who wrote the Babylonian Talmud didn't like the Hasmoneans because their descendants had a fratricidal and matricidal civil war, which led to Rome being invited into the land of Israel and eventually taking over. And de-emphasizing the role of the Hasmoneans and having a story about how God um, created this miracle would make this um, less about the Hasmoneans. There are other reasons why the rabbis didn't like the, Maccabe or the Hasmoneans. Uh, the Hasmoneans insisted on being both kings and high priests simultaneously. And according to the rabbinic understanding of biblical governance rules, you don't conflate church and state. Also, the Hasmoneans later killed many Pharisees who were the forerunners of the rabbis. Finally, it's helpful to know that the rabbis had an agenda of bringing God into holidays where God was not as apparent, such as Purim. So I'm not going to say that the story of the oil didn't happen, 
but there are things to know about why they might have perhaps chosen to write a story. Now, also worth saying in the defense of the rabbis, according to the Pasikta Rabati, the Hasmoneans made a makeshift menorah from the hollowed out ends of the spears. Those spear, end, spear ends held less oil than the original menorah did. So one day's worth of oil for the original menorah could have lasted eight days in a spear end menorah that doesn't hold as much oil. So in the spirit of the Talmud, just saying you're right and you're right, is entirely possible that there was something to this, even if there was a more rational explanation for why it happened or how it happened. All right, questions about the story? Well, having written down may not be important because don't forget all the oral Torah was not written down for a long time, it was all done verbally. So the fact that it wasn't written doesn't mean it didn't happen. Uh Piggybacking on that, I was wondering, I mean, could it also just be that the the rabbis considered accounts like one and two Maccabees to just be wrong entirely as as material? They didn't they didn't say that anything in there didn't happen. So they're not contradicting it, they're merely adding. Um, it is possible that the that you could consider this oral tour for the story of Hanukkah, which I guess it technically is. Um, it seems, I guess, it depends on whether you believe that everything that everything in the oral Torah also literally happened, or if it may have been or some of it may have been um, human thoughts about what might have happened. And I, I see, I have one other related question. Yeah. Um, were the sages also the people who instituted the holiday officially? Like within, no, no they weren't? No, the Hasmoneans said that according to, Ma according to the first book of Maccabees and the second, I believe, um, the Hasmoneans said that this day should be celebrated, or this eight day holiday should be celebrated from here on out. Oh, okay. And it was sort of just something that the Pharisees kind of, I guess the early rabbis, I don't know what they would have been called at this early point, kind of just dealt with as it occurred. Right. They, they came up with all sorts of, uh, they, they added more how to do it sorts of things as they did with other biblical ho with holidays that occurred during the time of the Bible. Um, but they did not institute it originally. Oh, okay, I see. Thank you. Was it the rabbis, the Hasmoneans, that decided to uh, increase the length of Shachrit service for these eight days? Rabbis. It's a question. <laughs> the, Has the Hasmoneans weren't doing Shachrit. They were, they were offering sacrifices. That's why they were trying to get the temple back in the first place. Specifically, the Matbea Sheltfila, the basic skeleton of the purse was uh, codified by Robin Gamaliel II around the year 100 of the Common Era. So immediately before the destruction, immediately after the destruction of the Second Temple when they realized that they had to come up with a new way of praying. And of course that's 200 years after the Hasmoneans. Yes, I, I, I think I might, I'd like to make a one point and raise a question. Uh, point, because um, you use the term oral law or the oral Torah, it might be helpful for people to understand that this is not, this story is not in the Mishnah, but only in, as I understand it anyway, it's only in the Gemara, or in, in the Palestinian, in the, uh, <clears throat> in the Talmud, and I think maybe only in the Babylonian, I'm not sure about that. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> um, so it's even later than that, but it's, it's, it's when you said, I think, but uh, the, the other thing is about the about the books of Maccabees. Uh, you know, there are these so-called books of Maccabees. There are four of them that, mm -hmm. that some Christians include in their canon. 
I take it we don't include, well, we don't have any of them in the Tanakh. Um, right. And, and I guess the latter, the latest one, the last ones, one of them I think is an out and out Christian book or thought to be, and one of them was written only in Greek and so on. So you might say something about, um, uh, about the canonical status or lack of it and why anybody would you know, rely on them or include them. Maybe that's too broad a question, but some, something yeah. related to that. Sure, so, so the Bible was closed in 444 by BCE by Ezra. The books of the books of Maccabees, the the, the Hasmoneans don't even come into being until 164 BCE. So 280 years later, after the Bible was closed. So the books of Maccabees are in the Apocrypha, which is the books that were written after the, Bible, the Hebrew Bible was closed. Um, and also before, during the, the BCE times. So they're in the Catholic Bible, um, the Apocrypha is including the Catholic Bible um, as like an in between the Old Testament and New Testament part, which is historically where they would be. Um, but they're not in the Jewish Bible and they're not in the Protestant Bible. They might also be in this Siri in some of the Greek Orthodox, the Eastern Orthodox Bibles. Not 100% positive about that. But we, we also have external um, corroboration from the stories of uh, at least the first two books of the Maccabees from Josephus. And while Josephus didn't live through the early Maccabean period, the um, fact that he tells a very similar story um, give some credence to at least the military aspects of uh, who was fighting where against whom when in the land of Israel between the, um, the um, early Osmanians, initially yeah. Maccabees and then the Osmanian dynasty thereafter. And there's a pretty good correspondence. I haven't actually sat down with all four books open in front of me and gone through them page by page, but my understanding is that two volumes of Josephus and the two first two volumes of the Maccabees uh, are mutually supportive in terms of historical, um, I won't say details, but certainly trends. All right, let's, recognizing the lack of, that we're getting close to the end of the hour, I'm going to quickly speed through the next bunch of sections. All right, so candles. Lots of cultures have candle lighting holidays in the winter, such as the Zoroastrian winter solstice holiday, um, which may have influenced this Hanukkah custom. Um, the Babylonian Talmud itself um, explains Hanukkah having to do with the first Adam, um, recognizing that the light lasted for fewer and fewer hours and then started increasing. And so he made a holiday to celebrate this. That's a lesser known explanation from the Talmud about Hanukkah. Um, regardless of how you feel about the story of the miracle of the oil, the, the menorah was lit according to all versions of this story. And so candle lighting is a way of recognizing that element of the story. Um, it is certainly no, no more far-fetched than including dipping in salt water on Passover to celebrate or to remember the tears of the slaves. Um, Josephus calls Hanukkah lights as of 70 CE, although he's not quite sure why it's called the Festival of Lights. Um, in the Mishnah, we have the mention of a Hanukkah lamp. Um, it's in the context of whether a shopkeeper is liable if a camel passing by with flax burns down their shop. Um, and the answer is yes, if the shopkeeper had a lamp outside, but no, if the lamp outside was a Hanukkah lamp. Um, note that a menorah is a seven branched um, lamp. That's the modern Hebrew word for lamp. A Hanukkah menorah is technically called a Hanukkah. People today still use the word menorah to mean Hanukkah, but they are technically doing different things. The Hanukkah of Mishnah times was made with made from clear stone. It had a hole for olive oil and another hole for wick. And you would use, you'd have more of these lamps as the holiday progressed. Um, in the Babylonian Talmud, we get all sorts of regulations about 
how we wait, with what we wait, when we wait, how much we wait, where to wait, all these details as we know them today come out of the Babylonian Talmud. Um, the Talmud also says you can't use the lights for anything, but given that this is a pre-electricity period when you're doing this in the dark and you need something to be able to see by, you can use another light. You can light another light and, as well as the Hanukkah lights. And that's how we get the Shamash. Um, we get the rules for the candle blessings in the Talmud, the Shabbat blessings come later based off the Hanukkah blessings. The Hanukkah of Talmudic times has eight holes for wicks. Um, in the 1800s, we start getting mass produced candles, which means that people can now afford candles. Um, so candles start becoming more widespread then. In the 1940s, we get brass Hanukkiot that are mass produced. In the 1960s, we start getting electric Hanukkiot that are mass produced and onward. Um, and after you light the candles, then it is traditional to sing Hanei Rod Halalu. Um, so moving on to latkes. Latkes are potato pancakes fried in oil to remember the rekindling of the menorah or the miracle of the oil, depending on how you feel about it. Happens to be that the Judean olive oil finished right around the 25th of Kislev when Hanukkah starts. Um, so there's oil around for these sorts of things. Now, the story of latkes starts really 600 years before Hanukkah with the story of Judith. Um, the Assyrians were threatening the Israelites. Um, Judith um, seduces the Assyrian general in his tent with salty with cheese and salty cheese and wine, gets him drunk, he falls asleep, she cuts off his head with a sword, saves the Jews. There was some confusion. Is this Assyrians or Syrians? Judith, Judah. So in the 1300s, Italian Jews start making fried ricotta cheese pancakes to eat on Hanukkah because they think that the story of Judith has to do with Hanukkah. And these are called cassola. When we get, when these pancakes migrate to Eastern Europe, um, we use goose fat instead uh, to, in, to fry the geese, the pancakes because geese are being slaughtered around this time. So there's a lot of goose fat around, um, but you can't fry cheese pancakes in goose fat. So now we have buckwheat pancakes because supposedly that's what the Maccabees ate. <coughs> then um, in the 1600s, potatoes migrate to Eastern Europe. And um, so by the 1800s, we now have everybody eating potatoes all the time. And so these become latkes because they uh, are a fancy potato, a fancy way of eating potatoes as a treat on Hanukkah. Um, in case you're wondering, latka first became an English word in 1927, according to the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, and there are other latka recipes from around the world, um, such as a zucchini and garlic one from Spartac countries, um, and a whole slew of other ones collected by Leah Koenig um, from around the world. Um, so again, another example of how we adapted surrounding cultures and made it our own. Um, we'll do questions at the end after nine o'clock. If you want to stick around, we're moving on to Sufganiyot. So Sufganiyot or jelly donuts. Um, North African Jews ate sweet fried, free, sweet fried balls of dough on Hanukkah. They call these sponge. Um, by the year 1000, Maimonides' father says, don't make fun of eating these Sufganim because the ancient ones ate them. And Sufganim comes from the Talmudic word for sponge. One of the very first printed text uh, cookbooks has a recipe, has the first recipe for a jam filled donut. Prior to this, donuts were savory, not sweet. But in the 1500s, we have Caribbean sugar plantations. So now sugar is available and everybody can have it. And so we get start getting sweet donuts. Um, and we also got fruit preserves now with sugar. So jelly donuts spread across Northern Europe. They become Berliners in Germany and Pachki in Polish and in Yiddish they become punchiks or punchkis, um, which are fried in goose fat instead of lard. Then the Polish and German Jews in the 1900s bring the punchkis or punchiks to Israel where they meet the Svenj and we get the Sufganiya. The story is made up that Sufganiya sounds like the word Sofganya, the end of the Garden of Eden, and God gave 
these to Adam and Eve after God kicked them out of the out of the Garden of Eden. Um, but really, this is a much newer word than that. Um, then in the 1920s, the National Labor Union, the Histadrut, pushes for Sufganiyot to become more widespread because this gives employment to Jewish bakers because they're harder to make at home than latkes. Um, the 1970s, American Jews bring Sufganiyot back to America and that starts becoming a thing here. 1980s, we get Dolce de Leche coming with the Argentinian immigrants. Um, and nowadays, Israelis eat 18 million Sufganiyot each year. So that's the story of Sufganiyot. Now, Miles Sor, in one minute uh, um, or so. So Miles Sor has more than one verse, it has six. Um, they were written in the 1100s or so. Um, the first five stanzas spell the word Mordechai, which is assumed to be Mordechai ben Isaac, who is assumed to be the author. Um, the first stanza is well known. Then we've got some stanzas about the Egyptians, the Babylonians, uh, Haman, and the Syrian Greeks persecuting us. The last one asks God to avenge us. Um, we have a the German tune is considered a Mycenae tune because it's so old, it's thought to go back to Sinai. It doesn't, it goes back to about the year 1000-ish or so, give or take 400 years. Um, and then there's a, an Italian version um, that a guy named Marcello put, wrote down. Um, and so that's another version of Mao's sword. There's a recording of this later on in the source sheet. Um, Elite Sion also got set to Mao's sword because that tune was really popular in the 1700s. Um, and then we get um, Rock of Ages written by Mar Marcus Glastro, who wrote the Talmud Dictionary in 1897 for American Jews. Um, and Mausur spreads to non Ashkenazi Jewish communities as they encounter it in Israel and America. Finally, we have an appendix with Hanukkah customs from around the world, which you can read at your leisure. There are 16 of them, twice the Knights of Hanukkah, and then a whole slew of Hanukkah songs on YouTube videos. So um, I apologize for moving quickly at the end, but I want to respect your time. <laughs>